So, we all know that RPGs lead to friendships, but how? Hey everyone, today I wanted to talk about something that's pretty important to all of us. Friendships. Our friends are the people we care about. They may not be our biological family, but they still mean a great deal to us. Sometimes they might even be so close they become our chosen or found family. Friends support us and care for us when we're going through tough times and cheer for us whenever we're successful. Friends are pretty great, and if you played any RPGs in the past, then it's pretty likely that you've developed some good friends in the process. But why? How does that work? Are RPGs really that good at helping people make friends? Well, I'll skip right to the last page and tell you now. Yes, playing RPGs can meet all the conditions to help people create long-lasting friendships. But the interesting thing isn't that RPGs do this. Mm -mm. The interesting thing is how RPGs create friendships. In order to understand that, we need to understand a few basic things. Basic things like what a friend is, and how friendships are formed, and what purpose they serve on a biological level. So, strap on your science helmets, because we're going to talk about monkeys, and then RPGs, but stick with me. So, what is a friendship? Defining friendships as social behavior is pretty simple, but breaking down the idea of what friendship is can actually be a little tough. That's because the idea of friendship can be considered kind of vague. Like, what purpose do friends serve? Why do humans create platonic social bonds? Is the idea a holdover from like when people made like alliances between tribes, or was it just a way for mammals to find mates? Well, according to psychologist Robert Seyfarth, friendship is a long-term positive relationship that involves cooperation. He and a team of other scientists discovered that by researching primates. The team spent a great deal of time observing different types of monkeys and baboons in Africa. And they observed that animals with strong social networks, like friendships, have longer lifespans and actually reproduce more. According to evolutionary anthropologist Robin Dunbar, friendship is about creating small-scale, intensely bonded groups that act as protection to life's stresses. Friends, and people who we can rely upon, are there to help us deal with difficult situations in life. And while most people aren't worried about being eaten by predatory animals anymore, the stress response still exists in humans. So apparently, one of the ways we cope with those stresses is to create friendship bonds with other people. We do this in order to help reduce the amount of stress we accumulate during our day-to-day -day lives. And I'm sure a lot of you are thinking like, okay, duh, but like how? How do humans make friends? So researchers have known for like a while now that there are really three key ingredients or building blocks that allow us to make friends. And those are proximity, repeated interactions, and a setting where we feel comfortable enough to let our guard down. You remember those monkeys that Seyfarth and his team were studying? They noticed several behaviors that helped to reinforce these principles. They discovered that those same monkeys spent a lot of time together. They saw that certain monkeys chose to spend time grooming other certain monkeys, and those monkeys kind of like expressed preferences about who was going to groom who. Those choices of who grooms who eventually led to closer connections. So those like tick off all the three boxes, right? The monkeys are close enough, like proximity-wise, to groom each other, and they do it frequently enough, and they're also in an environment that allows them to feel safe enough to actually get to grooming. But why does any of that matter? Well, Seyfarth's team found a few other connections that were present when the monkeys were making friends. Specifically, the amount of time spent with friends, the positive outcome of that time spent, and an equitable return of effort. They noticed that the monkeys spent around 20% of all their waking time grooming each other. If you do some quick math and account for like about six hours of sleep a day, that's around three to four hours of just social interaction. That's a lot of time. But looking at the response in the monkey's neurotransmitters, or brain chemistry, a positive outcome for all the grooming was seen. Their brains were releasing oxytocin and endorphins. And for those of you that don't know, these are the chemicals that help us feel safe and cared for. And they also help to create bonds between people. After they spent enough time with each other, the monkeys developed relationships that were equally helpful to both parties. But the final piece of the puzzle was an equitable return of effort. Because if one monkey spent like a good amount of time grooming the other one, and the favor wasn't returned, then a friendship wouldn't develop. But the team found that some monkeys would spend equal time grooming one another. That equity in grooming helped the monkeys to learn that their friend would help them and eventually help deal with larger issues, like the stresses of predation. But like I said before, humans have been at the top of the food chain for like a very long time. Yet, we still get stressed out. That's because there are still loads of other stressors that we face on a regular basis. Each person has their own set of troubles and issues, but they also have their own set of coping skills. When we have a friend, though, 
it helps us to develop additional resources and help mitigate stress through interaction, because brain chemicals like oxytocin can help alleviate the effects of stress chemicals in our brain like cortisol. Additionally, it's the idea that many hands make light work, right? So if you have difficulty in your life, it helps to have other people around to share the emotional burden. So you might be saying, great, I get how friends work. What the heck does this have to do with RPGs? Well, calm down, dude. I'm going to get there right now. For some people, building friends is natural and easy, but for others it can be pretty tough. Meeting new people is tricky, and how do you know if that new person has anything in common with you? Well, sometimes it helps to have a way to jumpstart those relationships. This can sometimes be called a common interest. Chances are, if you're watching this, then you're at least passively familiar with role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons or some other kind of game. So let's consider what RPGs do through the lens of the traditional sociological understanding of friendship. Because if we go back and look at it, the original list of what friendship was had three qualities. Proximity, repeated interactions, and a setting where we feel comfortable enough to let our guard down. If you consider the makeup of what like a standard in-person role-playing group looks like, you immediately can see how all three of those conditions are met. The people playing the game are in close proximity to another, they're like literally at the same table. Now, there is some question, at least to me, about whether or not a group that meets completely online still meets the same criteria for proximity, since the group isn't in like the same physical location. And honestly, I couldn't find any research about the difference between relationships that exist completely online versus in person in the context of role-playing games. For my own experience, I always find myself creating stronger bonds with people that I meet in person at some point. That's not to say that a completely long distance virtual relationship can't be helpful or valuable. Just that everybody has their own set of criteria for how much that proximity needs to be physical compared to virtual. I'm gonna bet since coronavirus made us all like experts on how video conferencing works, there's gonna be some really interesting research released in the next few years that addresses these specific questions, but... I digress. Because whether or not your group meets in person or online, their goal is probably to meet on a regular basis. If they do, then you can also tick off repeated interactions. Even if one or two people miss a session from time to time, there's still an expectation that some day of the week or month, time will be put aside for D&D or whatever you're playing. This aspect of repeated interaction is at least anecdotally one of the things that people struggle with the most when it comes to getting into the RPG hobby especially if they join the hobby after college and they've already got a full-time job and a family. But assuming everyone can get some time on like a Saturday night, the repeat interactions are taken care of. That just leaves the environment where people can feel comfortable enough to let their guard down. Generally speaking, a table where people are playing an RPG is a pretty welcoming place. People are sharing a common story, building a world, using their imaginations, cooperating, collaborating, and hopefully having a good time. People get to share their ideas and characters that they've created and tell a story that they find fun and engaging. That type of expression necessitates a certain level of vulnerability. If people are new to the hobby, it might be tough to find a table to play at, but once people do find a supportive table, they still feel comfortable enough to let their guard down and share some of their creativity, at least in a perfect world. Yeah, I know there are like a lot of examples of tables where people have engaged in like sometimes intentionally or accidentally creepy or inappropriate behavior, and unfortunately that happens in every hobby. Nothing's perfect. Not even D&D. But to me, it's worth the risk to try and meet new people enough to play the game and try to flex some of those creative brain muscles because in my experience, more often than not, most of the people that play role-playing games are pretty nice people. All three of the traditional pillars of making friends are handled pretty readily by like a normal RPG table. But what about Safarth's team and the monkeys that they study? Do RPGs still stack up with the other conditions? Well, yeah, they do. So remember, the pillars of monkey friendship were the amount of time spent with friends, the positive outcome of that spent time, and an equitable return of effort. So right off the bat, any RPG group that I've like ever been a part of meets for at least two hours. When I was younger, like high school or middle school, those sessions sometimes lasted for like an entire weekend. If our GM was able to like stay awake sometimes, sleep was like optional. So of course the amount of time that a group of players and a GM spend together is gonna to be quite a bit. Factoring in the traditional idea of friendship, of repeated interaction, you can see that the amount of time that people spend playing RPGs with their player group almost automatically nets them Boku points on their way to friendship. But time and repetition aren't everything. Think about people who are like out in the workforce with a full-time job. I spend at least 40 to 50 hours a week with the same people at work every week, but I spend very little, if any, of my time outside of work with those people. Does that mean they're not my friends? Not necessarily. Everyone is different, and people may indeed make lasting, excellent friendships with coworkers. But some work environments are really competitive. This competition means it can be hard to meet one of the original criteria for friendship, 
like having a setting where people can feel comfortable enough to let their guard down. I know that when I worked in the film industry, I spent like 70 to 80 hours a week with the same people on set, but it was a really kind of dog-eat-dog competitive environment. Like if you exposed any level of vulnerability or weakness from stress or fatigue, it was usually grounds for termination on that day. Even though we can spend a great deal of time with people, time isn't the only factor that creates friendships. The environment plays just as big of a part. Just think about like school if you're still a student. You can spend years in class with the same people and not even learn their names. That's why it's so important to remember the other parts of how friendships were observed with the monkeys. The positive outcome of the time spent grooming, like when the monkeys were grooming each other, was a massive part of what created friendships. At an RPG table, the group is not in competition with each other, or the game master. They all work together in order to tell the same story, the positive outcome of which doesn't even have to be completing a story arc, or maybe even keeping a character alive. The positive outcome is the social interaction that occurs at the table. I've played at a lot of tables where we spent a ton of time just like talking about the rules, planning our next move, or just going into a pub in-game and pretending to order dinner. The plot may not even move, and the characters may be our focus or completely forgotten. But the positive outcome of that social interaction is the release of those chemicals that help us feel safe and valued. Oxytocin and endorphins are released whenever we spend time doing things that are pleasurable and that we like, like laughing or singing or telling stories. I've done these things at the table before, and if the vast amount of RPG content available on the internet is any indication, I'm not alone. We enjoy RPGs because they help us to scratch a lot of social itches. And when we play them with people who value our contribution to the game, tactical, artistic, or otherwise, we see the positive result of the time we spend playing those games. Which dovetails really nicely into the final part of what SafeArth's monkey research showed us, an equitable return of effort. When all the players put forth effort and try to show the other members of the table that they care, players and GMs can hopefully see it for what it is, putting out effort. This might sound like an excuse to make sure that everybody trades off being the game master, but not necessarily. Sometimes people prefer to run the game and not play, and sometimes people aren't comfortable as the game master. Personally, I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't think that a player needs to show they care by taking a turn as the game master. If a player wants to take a turn as a game master, I would rather they do it because they want to, not because they feel like they have to or that they lose friends if they don't because people don't always put out effort the same way. Every player has different skills, in and out of game. Some players know the rules, some are really good at tactics, some take excellent notes, and some always remember to bring snacks. There are so many examples and so many different ways that I've seen players show that they care about the game and the people that they play with. If we, as players and GMs, take the time to acknowledge and appreciate the care and attention that other players bring to the table, then we're able to appreciate each other, not just for the value that each other brings to the game, but the value that we bring to each other's lives as friends. Because in my experience, many of my lifelong friends have one thing in common. At some point, I've played an RPG with them. And during that time, we were able to tick all the boxes that make up a friendship, both in the traditional sociological context and the way Safarth found it with the monkeys. It might sound rosy and amazing. RPGs are like a magic ticket to great friendships. But remember, friendships, just like any other relationship, take work. There is a give and a take to any relationship, and if we're able to spend time with people we care about, playing D&D or just hanging out and having a beer, that time is valuable. So enjoy your time at the table, but remember that even if all these conditions are met, your mileage may vary. Friendships come and go, games start and stop, but that doesn't mean they'll never come again. You will always be able to find another game. It may not be where you expect, and the people you're with may not be the ones you planned on, but the other games will happen. And no matter what, try and keep yourself open for friendships. We all need the support of others, even monkeys. So, that's all I've got. Thanks so much for watching. I wanted to make this episode for a while now, and I left some links to the articles that I used for research down in the description if you'd like to read a little bit more about how friendships work. Also, if you think this video would help other people understand why RPGs are so great, please feel free to share it around. I also recently started a TikTok, and I'm posting up some short videos about three to four times a week, so if you want to come on over and take a look, I'd love that too. If you like this video and want to see more like it, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the like button. I'd also like to thank all the people who support me over on Buy Me A Coffee. If you'd like to become a supporter, the link is in the description, and I really appreciate every donation. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Talking about friends today could have brought up some feelings about the people in your life. Maybe they're people who are truly there for you and you're comfortable asking for help. Maybe they're people who you want to grow a relationship with. No matter your situation, I wanted to encourage you to learn about setting boundaries. If someone is your friend, then that means they care about you and your well-being. And if at some point, if you or they do something that makes the other person uncomfortable, everybody's allowed to set personal boundaries. 
because if someone communicates a boundary, that's a way to help learn about the other person and keep them in your life. Setting boundaries doesn't always mean you want to cut somebody off. It just means that everybody is letting each other know what they are or are not comfortable with. So, if you or someone you care about sets a boundary, that's an opportunity for understanding and growth and to develop that friendship even more. Thanks so much for watching. Take care, be kind, and have fun adventuring.